June 16, The Healing of Naaman The king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. At this time, Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. One day the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. Go and visit the prophet, the king of Aram told him. I will send a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out, carrying as gifts 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter to the king of Israel said, With this letter I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, This man sends me a leper to heal? Am I God that I can give life and take it away? I can see that he's just trying to pick a fight with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent this message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me, and he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored, and you will be healed of your leprosy. But Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Abana and the Farpar, better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. But his officers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says simply, Go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him. And his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child's, and he was healed. Then Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God. They stood before him, and Naaman said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel, so please accept a gift from your servant. But Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept any gifts. And though Naaman urged him to take the gift, Elisha refused. Then Naaman said, All right, but please allow me to load two of my mules with earth from this place, and I will take it back home with me. From now on, I will never again offer burnt offerings or sacrifices to any other god except the Lord. However, may the Lord pardon me in this one thing. When my master, the king, goes into the temple of the god Rimmon to worship there and leans on my arm, may the Lord pardon me when I bow to. Go in peace, Elisha said. So Naaman started home again. The Greed of Gehazi But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master should not have let this Aramean get away without accepting any of his gifts. As surely as the Lord lives, I will chase after him and get something from him. So Gehazi set off after Naaman. When Naaman saw Gehazi running after him, he climbed down from his chariot and went to meet him. Is everything all right? Naaman asked. Yes, Gehazi said, but my master has sent me to tell you that two young prophets from the hill country of Ephraim have just arrived. He would like seventy-five pounds of silver and two sets of clothing to give to them. By all means, take twice as much silver, Naaman insisted. He gave him two sets of clothing, tied up the money in two bags, and sent two of his servants to carry the gifts for Gehazi. But when they arrived at the citadel, Gehazi took the gifts from the servants and sent the men back. Then he went and hid the gifts inside the house. When he went in to his master, Elisha asked him, Where have you been, Gehazi? I haven't been anywhere, he replied. But Elisha asked him, Don't you realize that I was there in spirit when Naaman stepped down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to receive money and clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and cattle, and male and female servants? Because you have done this, you and your descendants will suffer from Naaman's leprosy forever. When Gehazi left the room, he was covered with leprosy. His skin was white as snow. The Floating Axe Head One day the group of prophets came to Elisha and told him, 
As you can see, this place where we meet with you is too small. Let's go down to the Jordan River, where there are plenty of logs. There we can build a new place for us to meet. All right, he told them, go ahead. Please come with us, someone suggested. I will, he said. So we went with them. When they arrived at the Jordan, they began cutting down trees. But as one of them was cutting a tree, his axe head fell into the river. Oh, sir, he cried, it was a borrowed axe. Where did it fall? the man of God asked. When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it into the water at that spot. Then the axe head floated to the surface. Grab it, Elisha said. And the man reached out and grabbed it. Elisha traps the Arameans. When the king of Aram was at war with Israel, he would confer with his officers and say, We will mobilize our forces at such and such a place. But immediately Elisha, the man of God, would warn the king of Israel, Do not go near that place, for the Arameans are planning to mobilize their troops there. So the king of Israel would send word to the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again Elisha warned the king so that he would be on the alert there. The king of Aram became very upset over this. He called his officers together and demanded, Which of you is the traitor? Who has been informing the king of Israel of my plans? It's not us, my lord the king, one of the officers replied. Elisha, the prophet in Israel, tells the king of Israel even the words you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. Go and find out where he is, the king commanded, so I can send troops to seize him. And the report came back, Elisha is at Dothan. So one night the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. When the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? the young man cried to Elisha. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than on theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes. And when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. As the Aramean army advanced toward him, Elisha prayed, O Lord, please make them blind. So the Lord struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Then Elisha went out and told them, You have come the wrong way. This isn't the right city. Follow me, and I will take you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to the city of Samaria. As soon as they had entered Samaria, Elisha prayed, O Lord, now open their eyes and let them see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and they discovered that they were in the middle of Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he shouted to Elisha, My father, should I kill them? Should I kill them? Of course not, Elisha replied. Do we kill prisoners of war, give them food and drink, and send them home again to their master? So the king made a great feast for them, and then sent them home to their master. After that, the Aramean raiders stayed away from the land of Israel. Ben-Hadad besieges Samaria Sometime later, however, King Ben-Hadad of Aram mustered his entire army and besieged Samaria. As a result, there was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 pieces of silver and a cup of dove's dung sold for five pieces of silver. One day, as the king of Israel was walking along the wall of the city, a woman called to him. Please help me, my lord the king. He answered, If the lord doesn't help you, what can I do? I have neither food from the threshing floor nor wine from the press to give you. But then the king asked, What is the matter? She replied, This woman said to me, Come on, let's eat your son today. Then we will eat my son tomorrow. So we cooked my son and ate him. Then the next day I said to her, Kill your son so we can eat him but she has hidden her son. When the king heard this, he tore his clothes in despair. And as the king walked along the wall, the people could see that he was wearing burlap under his robe next to his skin. May God strike me and even kill me if I don't separate Elisha's head from his shoulders this very day, the king vowed. Elisha was sitting in his house with the elders of Israel when the king sent a messenger to summon him. But before the messenger arrived, Elisha said to the elders, A murderer has sent a man to cut off my head. When he arrives, shut the door and keep him out. We will soon hear his master's steps following him. While Elisha was still saying this, the messenger arrived, and the king said, All this misery is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer?
Elisha replied, Listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. By this time tomorrow in the markets of Samaria, five quarts of choice flour will cost only one piece of silver, and ten quarts of barley grain will cost only one piece of silver. The officer assisting the king said to the man of God, That couldn't happen even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. But Elisha replied, You will see it happen with your own eyes, but you won't be able to eat any of it. Lepers visit the enemy camp. Now there were four men with leprosy sitting at the entrance of the city gates. Why should we sit here waiting to die? They asked each other. We will starve if we stay here, but with the famine in the city we will starve if we go back there. So we might as well go out and surrender to the Aramean army. If they let us live, so much the better. But if they kill us, we would have died anyway. So at twilight, they set out for the camp of the Arameans. But when they came to the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Aramean army to hear the clatter of speeding chariots and the galloping of horses and the sounds of a great army approaching. The king of Israel has hired the Hittites and Egyptians to attack us, they cried to one another. So they panicked and ran into the night, abandoning their tents, horses, donkeys, and everything else as they fled for their lives. When the lepers arrived at the edge of the camp, they went into one tent after another, eating and drinking wine, and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and hid it. Finally, they said to each other, This is not right. This is a day of good news, and we aren't sharing it with anyone. If we wait until morning, some calamity will certainly fall upon us. Come on, let's go back and tell the people at the palace. So they went back to the city and told the gatekeepers what had happened. We went out to the Aramean camp, they said, and no one was there. The horses and donkeys were tethered and the tents were all in order, but there wasn't a single person around. Then the gatekeeper shouted the news to the people in the palace. Israel plunders the camp. The king got out of bed in the middle of the night and told his officers, I know what has happened. The Arameans know we are starving, so they have left their camp and have hidden in the fields. They are expecting us to leave the city, and then they will take us alive and capture the city. One of his officers replied, We had better send out scouts to check into this. Let them take five of the remaining horses. If something happens to them, it will be no worse than if they stay here and die with the rest of us. So two chariots with horses were prepared, and the king sent scouts to see what had happened to the Aramean army. They went all the way to the Jordan River following a trail of clothing and equipment that the Arameans had thrown away in their mad rush to escape. The scouts returned and told the king about it. Then the people of Samaria rushed out and plundered the Aramean camp. So it was true that five quarts of choice flour were sold that day for one piece of silver, and ten quarts of barley grain were sold for one piece of silver, just as the Lord had promised. The king appointed his officer to control the traffic at the gate, but he was knocked down and trampled to death as the people rushed out. So everything happened exactly as the man of God had predicted when the king came to his house. The man of God had said to the king, By this time tomorrow in the markets of Samaria, five quarts of choice flour will cost one piece of silver, and ten quarts of barley grain will cost one piece of silver. The king's officer had replied, That couldn't happen even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. And the man of God had said, You will see it happen with your own eyes, but you won't be able to eat any of it. And so it was for the people trampled him to death at the gate. The woman from Shunem returns home. Elisha had told the woman whose son he had brought back to life, take your family and move to some other place, for the Lord has called for a famine on Israel that will last for seven years. So the woman did as the man of God instructed. She took her family and settled in the land of the Philistines for seven years. After the famine ended, she returned from the land of the Philistines, and she went to see the king about getting back her house and land. As she came in, the king was talking with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God. The king had just said, Tell me some stories about the great things Elisha has done. And Gehazi was telling the king about the time Elisha had brought a boy back to life. At that very moment, the mother of the boy walked in to make her appeal to the king about her house and land. Look, my lord the king, Gehazi exclaimed, here is the woman now, and this is her son, the very one Elisha brought back to life. Is this true? the king asked her, and she told him the story. So he directed one of his officials to see that everything she had lost was restored to her, including the value of any crops that had been harvested during her absence. Hazael murders Ben-Hadad. 
Elisha went to Damascus, the capital of Aram, where King Ben-Hadad lay sick. When someone told the king that the man of God had come, the king said to Hazael, Take a gift to the man of God. Then tell him to ask the Lord, Will I recover from this illness? So Hazael loaded down forty camels with the finest products of Damascus as a gift for Elisha. He went to him and said, Your servant Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, has sent me to ask, Will I recover from this illness? And Elisha replied, Go and tell him, You will surely recover. But actually the Lord has shown me that he will surely die. Elisha stared at Hazael with a fixed gaze until Hazael became uneasy. Then the man of God started weeping. What's the matter, my lord? Hazael asked him. Elisha replied, I know the terrible things you will do to the people of Israel. You will burn their fortified cities, kill their young men with the sword, dash their little children to the ground, and rip open their pregnant women. Hazael responded, How could a nobody like me ever accomplish such great things? Elisha answered, The Lord has shown me that you are going to be the king of Aram. When Hazael left Elisha and went back, the king asked him, What did Elisha tell you? And Hazael replied, He told me that you will surely recover. But the next day Hazael took a blanket, soaked it in water, and held it over the king's face until he died. Then Hazael became the next king of Aram.